This morning's scripture is from the book of Ephesians, <clears throat> chapter 4, uh, verses 7 through 16. Now grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive. He gave gifts to the people. But what does he ascended mean, except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. And he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, equipping the saints for the work of ministry to build up the body of Christ, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness in the techniques of deceit, but speaking the truth in love, let us grow in every way into Him who is the head, Christ. From Him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building up itself in love by the proper working of each individual part. Let me pray. Uh, Father, uh, thank you so much for this morning. Uh, God, we're grateful for your goodness to us. Uh, God, we're grateful for your presence uh, that is in this place. And Lord, we're thankful for your faithfulness and how we get to gather each and every week and um, just push towards you. And so, Father, um, I pray as we open up your word this morning, uh, Lord, you'd open up our hearts and minds to what it would have to say. Uh, Lord, this not, let this not be about us. Let it be about you. Uh, let your son be at the center of everything that we do. Uh, But God, just guide us in ways that we need to be guided through the direction of your word this morning. It's in your son's name I pray. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, How's everybody doing this morning? Good. I am glad to hear that. Uh, My name is Michael. Uh, I am the lead pastor here. Uh, Thank you so much for being here. If it's your first time at Salt Church, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, We are super excited that you're here. I hope you felt welcome the minute you got here. Uh, Quick update. I just wanted to say this because it's awesome. Uh, So last Sunday, uh, we took a little bit of time out of our service to pray for Carson Gray, uh, a first grader uh, at our church, or second grader, I should say. Um, But pray for him. He was in the hospital. He was paralyzed from like the waist down. And uh, we prayed for him as a church. I believe like the church went home and prayed. Uh, A lot of prayer was directed his way. Uh, He walked out of the hospital on Tuesday night, and he was actually here in the first service. So pretty awesome. You know, I was just praying on Monday for him, and I was like, Lord, let him like walk sometime today. It'd be a really good testimony of your faithfulness to our church. And then like two hours later, Michael and Heidi text me. They're like, he's walking. I'm like, whoa. (laughs) Sometimes that happens, and it shows that uh, the song we just sang, you know, we're repeating like, you are good, you are good, you are good. Like God is good, even if he didn't answer our prayer, Uh, but his goodness is shown to us in tangible moments like that. So that is the end of my tangent. I could pray and we could be just missed. Um, So hey, we are in uh, week three uh, of our What is the Church series. And uh, if you've been gone for the past couple weeks, uh, this is a pivotal time or season uh, in the life of our church where we are moving toward church membership. And so we're in the midst of a five-week series called What is the Church that is essentially uh, all exploring just that, what is the church? Uh, So what does it mean to be the church? Uh, What is the local church? Who is the head of the church? What is my role? What's your role in the church? All those things over these next five weeks. And uh, I've said this every week so far. This is the last time I'll announce these two resources. Uh, But as kind of like a primer to church membership, since we all come from different backgrounds, uh, a couple different different resources that we want to provide. Uh, First is a book called Love Your Church, a really easy book to read about what it looks like to be a good churchgoer. Uh, So we have copies of this for free that are available at Connect Central. Pick one of those out. Uh, Worst writing, but I tried my absolute best. I wrote a paper called Why Church Membership, Uh, just from a Salt Church perspective, a pastoral perspective, uh, why we feel it is a biblical and necessary thing for our church. Uh, So those are two resources to grab. Uh, They will be at Connect Central the next couple weeks. I just won't announce those anymore. So grab one of those. And then the hope is by the five-week series and the resources, uh, you will have enough primer at least uh, to come back uh, Sunday, March 24th, coming up in a couple weeks, uh, a membership interest meeting that's going to happen right here in this auditorium from 6 to 8 p.m. And uh, we'd love to have you all here. What that's going to look like 
is uh, me, Brad, and Scott, the three elders here. Uh, each of us are going to play a different role in that time where we're up talking, outlining uh, what does it mean to be a member, uh, what are the core doctrines that every Christian should believe, what are the doctrines at Salt Church that we teach. Um, also uh, telling you about the next steps. What does it look like? Um, so we would love for all of you to be here. Uh, we don't want to create any hurdle for you to be here. So Salt Kids is available for that meeting. Uh, it's not full programming for Salt Kids. What they normally do, they're not going to be up there telling your kids about membership. Uh, we're doing something way more fun. Some of the adults want to go in there. They're going to do a movie night. Uh, so if you have kids from like nursery to fifth grade, uh, they're going to be playing a movie. It's going to be a fun time. Salt Kids has their own Connect Central. They are just moving and shaking up there. If you want more details about what that looks like for your child, uh, ask the people up in Salt Kids. Uh, so two resources and then the meeting on the 24th. There you go. Uh, so this morning, uh, as we turn to week number three, uh, we are going to talk about how the church is diverse. And uh, when you hear the word diverse, uh, I don't want you to think from like a generational perspective or like an ethnic perspective, uh, but instead the church is diverse uh, in the way that Christ himself has wired all of us differently in this room, and he's also gifted all of us differently, everybody gathered in this room. And we'll see this morning uh, that all of us in this room have a part to play in the overall body of a local congregation, whether uh, you walked in here and you just feel like I'm one percent gifted, man, I don't have much to offer, or if you could barely fit your head in the door and you think you're the next greatest thing to the local church, I don't care where you're at, we all have a gift to play in the body of Christ. Uh, so hopefully uh, you all have your Bibles open to Ephesians 4, the church is diverse, and we're hopefully I will show you that this morning through the Word of God. So Ephesians 4, chapter, chapter 4, verse 7, uh, the Apostle Paul says this, he says, now grace was given to each one of us, right? Not just me, not just you, each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Uh, so I've mentioned this is a little bit of a mini-series on the book of Ephesians. Uh, the Apostle Paul writing this to the church at Ephesus. Uh, Paul is in prison when he writes this. And this letter to the church at Ephesus is a very positive letter. Most of Paul's letters, negative. The churches weren't doing well. Uh, the church at Ephesus was doing awesome. Uh, Paul is very much encouraging them, exhorting them. A church that's already doing well. He's saying, hey, just stay along those tracks and here's the way to to do that. Uh, it showed the Ephesian believers then, and then it shows us today, that even if our th things are going well, which I would argue like at Salt Church, things have gone uh, majority well, uh, we can always strive as a church to continue to push forward. Uh, so at the start of Ephesians 4, we kind of skipped over verses 1 through 6, which is like some of the best texts in all of the Bible. Uh, but at the start of Ephesians 4, Paul starts to get into like the nitty gritty of what it looks like for the church to be unified. Uh, verses 1 through 6. So one day uh, in the future, hopefully soon, we will have our own church building. And when we have our own church building, I promise Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 will be painted on some wall somewhere. Uh, Paul exhorts the members of the church as a corporate body to act together in a specific way. Uh, he says, you should be humble with one another. Uh, you should be gentle with one another. You should be patient with one another. In church, you should bear with one another in love. And then lastly, make every effort among you to maintain the unity with one another. Uh, beautiful, beautiful things that if we could apply, man, I can't tell you what this church could accomplish. Uh, but this morning, we're kind of skipping over all that. We're going to land in verse 7. And you see the transitional word now. Uh, some of your translations might say but. Uh, transitional word where Paul in verses 1 through 6 is kind of talking about unity as a whole. Now verse 7, he transitions that to talk about how does unity look as you the individual. How individuals make up the organism of the church. And as he does this, uh, he's going to set the underlying foundation of what develops all of us as Christians. Uh, Paul from the outset says that grace was given to each one of us according to the measure of Christ's gift. Uh, all of us in this room, if you proclaim Christ, if you're a Christian, uh, you've been given some measure of grace. 
Uh, a lot of us hear that word grace, and the first thing our minds go to is like saving grace, like the forgiveness of sins, which is definitely what grace is, but grace has multiple aspects to it. Uh, here, Paul's talking about the grace that God bestows upon his people that enables them to serve and push the church. And notice that it's given in measures, which is the point of this sermon, essentially. That the church is a, div a, di a diverse body of believers given different measures of grace. Uh, not racially, not socially, not generationally. In this context, the church is diverse in our measures of grace according to our giftedness. And our giftedness then should push the mission of the church forward. Uh, let me just real quick use a practical example of that. Uh, many of you should know Clint Hill. Uh, if you don't know Clint, uh, Clint is the leader of our setup and teardown team. Uh, at church plants, uh, most setup and teardown leaders last about six to seven months. Uh, Clint has been the leader of that ministry since we started, so going on like three and a half years. Uh, so if you get here at 7 a.m. on any given Sunday, uh, you'll see Clint uh, meticulously putting things in place. Uh, the trash can, right next to the Salt Kids check-in station, it is in the same exact spot on the floor every single week because Clint puts it there. Some would call that OCD. I call that a measure of grace. It's a grace that God has gifted to Clint to have a passion to do what he does. It's grace that God provides to Chris, who is playing drums today, who Chris is an incredible, incredible drummer, but yet he knows how to come into a church and hit the drums not too loud so he doesn't overwhelm the sound of the band and keep the band on pace, but he can jam way more than what he does on a Sunday. Less measure of grace, me playing the drums. So measures of grace, right? Uh, we have over 250 volunteers at this church. Uh, I could go on and on about a lot of you in this room on how God's gifted you in specific areas, but the point I'm trying to make is this. We've all been given grace, and in our diversity, uh, we should collectively come together and push the mission of the church forward. But again, it's the gift of Christ. Christ is the head. He's the cornerstone. If you don't have Christ, you don't have a gift. That's why Paul quickly puts Christ at the center so that even if all of us are way, way gifted, none of us can boast in our gift because it comes from Christ. Uh, Paul uses verse 8 to quote Psalm 68. He says, for it says, when he, that is Christ, ascended on high, he took the captives captive and he gave gifts to people. So what does this mean? So when did Christ ascend on high? Uh, remember, Christ is crucified. Uh, he's nailed to a cross. He dies. He's put in a tomb. Three days later, Christ resurrects out of the tomb, which we'll celebrate in a couple weeks. Uh, he stays on earth after he resurrects. He stays on earth for a period of 40 days, appearing to his disciples. And then in Acts 1, you see Christ ascend into heaven, uh, where Christ currently is at the right hand of God the Father. But when he ascends into heaven, you see this at the end of Matthew, beginning of Acts, he says, all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me, so go and make disciples. And what he's doing in that moment is he is giving the church gifts. He is ascending into heaven so that the church could be his body or his bride. So that gets a little more clear in verse 9. Paul says, but what does he ascended mean except that he also descended to the lower parts of the earth? The one who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens to fill all things. So a lot of that is a lot of words going on in those two verses. So what does it mean? If Christ ascended, then he must also have sometime descended. If he went up, or if he was up, that sometime he came down. Uh, John 1.14 uh, says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Christ became flesh, uh, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity, takes on flesh and dwells among us. Uh, that's called the doctrine of the incarnation. So Christ, who's there at creation in the beginning, takes on flesh in John 1, comes down from on high, and then descends to the earth, the lower parts of the earth. He accomplishes what he wanted to accomplish, and then he ascends back into heaven. Why? So that he might fill all things. So what encompasses part of all things? Uh, back to verse 8. For it says, when he ascended on high, he took the captives captive, and he gave gifts to his people. So what did Jesus come to this earth to accomplish? 
Jesus came to defeat Satan, sin, and death. That's what it means by he took the captives captive. He defeats the enemy at the cross. He declares victory over Satan, sin, and death. And in giving so, he gives gifts to his church. And when he does that, his grace is then given to us by him bestowing measures of giftedness to us, which should fill a functional role at a local church. Christ is the head. Christ is in charge. He gives his people gifts so that his local church can be served. The diversity of our gifts then should point back to Christ and therefore accomplish his glory. So all of that is foundational. The gifts come from Christ. Now, what are the specific gifts? Uh, There's a lot of lists of spiritual gifts all throughout the New Testament. Here are five gifts that have been given to help promote the local church here in Ephesians 4. Uh, Starting in verse 11, Paul says this, and he, gave himself, and, and he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. So five different offices or gifts, uh, apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. Uh, remember, there's measures of the gifts. They're also not fully encompassing. Nobody in this room has all five of those gifts and is just killing it, trust me. Uh, there's some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, you get the point. And this is really, really important. There's a separation between having a gift and fulfilling the role of an actual office. Uh, But yet, if you don't have the office, you should still exercise your gifts. So, for example, my office here at Salt Church, I hold the title or the office of pastor or elder. Uh, But the gift that I mostly get to express and exercise is the gift that God's given me to teach. Uh, But to teach, you don't necessarily need to be an elder. Uh, There's several people in this church that have been given the gift of teaching. They don't need to be an elder in order to express that gift. So what I'm trying to say is just because you don't hold a title doesn't mean you should just squander all the gifts that God's given you. Uh, Some of you in this room who are new to the faith or you're new to church may not even know how the Lord's wired you yet, and your gifts could be on display five, ten years from now. So what are these gifts? What does it mean to be these things? Uh, First gift is you have it as an apostle. Uh, An apostle is someone with the gift to authoritatively claim the message of Jesus Christ either in written or oral form. Uh, So in Scripture, you have two different types of apostles. You have like capital A apostles. Uh, Those guys did ministry with Jesus. They were eyewitnesses of Jesus' ministry. They saw him resurrect. They saw him ascend. And then you have the apostle Paul who writes this letter who becomes an apostle later. Capital A apostles. Uh, At Salt Church, we believe that that office, capital A apostle, is closed. Uh, Anyone who comes to you and tells you they are on par with the apostles from Scripture, uh, we would suggest do not listen to that person. Uh, A little a apostle is some of us in this room. Someone who can authoritatively claim the message of Jesus Christ either in oral form or written form. Uh, Second gift is this, is the gift of prophecy or prophet. Uh, Again, this gift gets all out of sorts. Uh, One commentary defines a prophet as this. Uh, A prophet was one who is endowed by the Holy Spirit with the gift of prophecy for the purposes of edification, comfort, encouragement, and further to understand and communicate the mysteries and revelation of God to the church. The prophetic gift may include a predictive element However, the prophet is not one who is overcome by some uncontrolled ecstatic force, but rather one who is self-control when receiving the revelation. So say that louder for the people in the back. That's a prophet. Someone that's given revelation by the Lord. A prophet is not someone who stands up and tries to add to what Scripture already has for us. Uh, We as a church believe that the 66 books of this Bible, which is called the canon, we believe that the canon is closed. We believe that in these 66 books of the Bible, uh, God has given us all the revelation that we need in order to be saved and live a life of righteousness. So someone with the gift to be a prophet is someone who has been gifted to take the knowledge of the scriptures that have already been written and then use that knowledge to help guide people to edify them, to comfort them, to encourage them, and help them to understand the mysteries of God. That's the office of prophet. Uh, Third gift is the evangelist. 
Uh, these are the people that are absolutely uh, needed in the church, those people who are given the gift to preach the message of salvation to those who we described last week, those who are far off or far away. Uh, an evangelist is somebody with a giftedness uh, who has a burden on their heart for the lost that are around him. Uh, an evangelist is somebody that's been wired in such a way that they've been given very clear understanding and a very clear way uh, to tell the story of the gospel in a clear and concise manner in order to direct people to salvation in Christ. Again, this is a vitally important role in the church. If this church doesn't have anybody with the gift of evangelism, uh, this church will just become a social club. Uh, no new life will ever come here if we don't evangelize the lost, and we'll become 100% inward, and we might as well shut down. I'd rather golf. Uh, fourth gift is the televangelist. Just kidding. Uh, Want to lighten you guys up a little bit. Fourth gift, the pastor. Uh, we went over this in detail a couple weeks ago. Uh, that word pastor is synonymous with the word shepherd, same word in the Greek. Uh, again, shepherd, not to beat a dead horse, but what's a shepherd's job? A shepherd's job is to care for the sheep. Uh, they tend to the sheep, but you guys aren't sheep, you're actually humans. Uh, the shepherd is to care for the congregation. Uh, other words for shepherd, pastor, are captain, leader, chief. You can call me any of those things, and I'm cool with it. Uh, I don't even like when people call me Pastor Michael. My name's Michael, okay? Uh, but what does someone with the gift of pastoring or shepherding do? Uh, those people minister to people who are troubled in the church. Uh, we're there to encourage the people, to comfort the believers in times of, uh, where they need comfort, to administer activities uh, like baptism and communion. Uh, shepherd and pastor, synonymous words. Lastly, uh, some say this is interchangeable with pastor. I disagree. Uh, would be the gift of teacher. Uh, teacher is something like what I'm doing right now, instructing people of God in doctrine, teaching you how to take the Bible and apply it to your daily life. I would argue that not all people who are good at teaching are good at shepherding, and not all people who are good at shepherding are good at teaching, uh, but that's beside the point. You can write that down. Uh, so what's the point of all these gifts? Uh, it's for one of my top five favorite verses in the Bible, uh, Ephesians 4.12. He gave the apostles, he gave the prophets, he gave the evangelists, he gave the shepherds, he gave the teachers to equip the saints for the work of ministry, for building up the body of Christ. So who are the saints? The New Orleans football, no. Who are the saints? All of us. All of us in this room, Christians, you are called saints. The Greek word is hagias, not hagandas. Hagias, the people of God. If you are a Christian, you are called a saint in Scripture. And saints, you are all given measures of gifts so that we can all be equipped to do the work of the ministry. Right now at Salt Church, there's 10 of us who hold any sort of office of leadership or any role of leadership at this church. That basically means that there's 10 of us at this church that have people report to us. Uh, those are 10 people who have gifts, and they have an office or a title to go along with the gift. Uh, our church, every single Sunday, has around 500 people who attend here on a weekly basis. Uh, not this week, it's spring break. Uh, if it was just 10 of us, Doing the work of the 500, I'm not a huge math guy, but 10 divided by 500 is .02. Uh, you convert that to a percentage. If 10 of us were the only ones doing the work of the ministry, that would mean that 2% of the church is doing the work of the 98%. If that happened, we might as well shut our doors. Nothing will ever be stirred around here. No leaders will ever be developed. Christ gives a measure of gifts for some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry to build up the body of Christ. Church, the ministry of Jesus Christ belongs to the people of Jesus Christ. So no matter what your role is here, no matter what level of giftedness you think you have, no matter if you've been clearly called or you've never been called in your life, you as a Christian this morning are called to do the work of the ministry. That all of us collectively in this room build up the body of Christ, which is the local church. For us, that's Salt Church. So those are the gifts and now we'll transition to the questions of, well, how long should we do this thing called church? Why should we do this? And how practically should we treat each other? Uh, so first, how long? How long is Salt Church going to be a church? 
Uh, how long is the local church supposed to function? Look at verse 13. We're supposed to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of God's Son, growing into maturity with a stature measured by Christ's fullness. Uh, this has been a common theme over the past three weeks. We remain a church until we reach ultimate unity together. We remain a church until all of us have complete and utter knowledge of God's Son together, that we are all spiritually mature together. Uh, church, we've made strives to accomplish this over three years, but there's still a really, really long way to go for all of us in this room, including me. Uh, any organization that serves uh, to lead any sort of like impact on their community has to first and foremost strive for unity as an organization. And for us as a church, our unity is surrounded by our faith in the gospel. Uh, unity around common doctrines that unite us as believers like Christ's virgin birth, his resurrection, but also as a local church, there has to be unity under common doctrines that unite us as a local church. Uh, we as a church strive to increase our knowledge of God's Son, who's obviously Jesus Christ, who for Christ's riches, richness and mercy and everything that Christ has given us, uh, we get to sit here and gather up as believers today. Uh, the older I get, the more I study, the more I counsel people, uh, the more I do this job, the more I read my Bible, uh, the more wonder I have of Jesus Christ. Uh, church, beyond anything else, like that's my prayer for you. Uh, whether you're 17 years old or you're 70 years old in this room, we've got somebody in this room in their mid-90s. My prayer for you is that all of us could run at the same exact pace toward Jesus Christ that all of us could dig deep into the minds of who Christ is and see what that means for your life. And in turn, as you run toward Christ and you strive after Christ, what that does is it produces in you a holiness that you've never experienced before. That process never stops. The pursuit of Christ never stops. None of us are ever gonna just get there. The longing for you to be like Christ should never stop. And those two things, unity in the faith and knowledge of God's Son, are promised to grow us into maturity. So how long will that take? In my experience, forever. The answer to that is we will be a church until Christ returns. Whether I stand up here or I don't, I can be hit by a bus. This church will be here until Christ returns. Guys, there's not one pastor on this earth that has the giftedness to lead their entire congregation into complete unity and maturity. Why? Because it's not the pastor's job, it's the church's job to do that together. So since that's the case, what do we do? We gather together on Sundays. We get together midweek for Bible studies and groups and things like that so we can all strive together toward unity in Christ. Uh, so that's the how long. What about the why? This is important. Why do we do this? Uh, look at verse 14. Paul tells us, Then we will no longer be little children tossed by the waves and blown around by every wind of teaching, by human cunning with cleverness and the techniques of deceit. The result of being unified in the faith, the result of being increased in our knowledge of God's Son, the result of those things is a firm foundation that you get individually and in turn our church has collectively. Uh, this speaks to our spiritual maturity, right? Uh, I don't take my four kids, my kids are eight, seven, seven, and four. Uh, I don't take my four kids, let's just say my twins for instance, they're seven. I'm not just like, I don't tell Kristen, hey, you know what, Knox and Nash, they're seven, they're in first grade. Let's just like throughout the week, let, let's just expose them to the wolves and like crazy liberalism. You know what, they're seven, dear, they know how to read. Uh, they're smart enough. They know where the library is located. If they get it taught anything weird, they'll know how to figure out the answer. None of us do that with our kids. Why? My kids might be young, but when they're young, their minds are moldable. I do everything as their dad to protect them 
from decisions of where we send them to school, to what they watch on TV, to who we surround our family with when we go out to places. I'm not trying to shelter my four kids, but rather me and my wife prayerfully make decisions to take as much time as we possibly can while they're young and pour foundational knowledge into their lives so that when they get the age where different philosophies and different cultures and things that we disagree with are being thrown at them, they can understand the truth from the counterfeit. This is where you continue to see why the local church is important, why the structure of a church as a family is important. Everyone in here has come in here today with a different background and ultimately a a different level of spiritual maturity. Our job as a church is to take the clear things of the Bible and make those things abundantly clear so that you can go out and spot counterfeits. Because trust me, verse 14 is active in the world today. Just get on Instagram. There are plenty of cunning and clever teachers out there who sound right, but yet they operate with a level of deceit. It's the elder's job at this church to protect the sheep from those kind of things. This is why we're super careful about the songs we sing on Sundays. It's we're super careful about the curriculum we teach your kids up in Salt Kids. It's not so we can be a dictatorship. It's so that we can protect the sheep from counterfeit attacks because you will get attacked. What separates Christianity from every single religion in the world is what we inherently believe about Jesus Christ. If you can't define who Jesus is further than he died on the cross for my sins, what happens is you are in a position where you are in a position that you could be blown around by different doctrines and things that can be put in your way. So how do you combat a lack of knowledge or a lack of spiritual maturity? You as a Christian or you as a churchgoer should plug into a local church that considers the doctrines of God to be an important thing. You as a churchgoer should dive deep into a local church that trains you to spot the counterfeit. You identify as a churchgoer with a local church that will help you strive toward Christian maturity. Salt Church isn't a perfect church, but we strive toward all those things and to push our church toward those things. Uh, Church, we're doing a three-year series in the book of Matthew. And we're not doing a three-year series in Matthew because I'm bored and I don't know how to pick out sermon series. We're doing a three-year series in the book of Matthew because my prayer for this church is that your foundational level of knowledge is just simply this. I want you to know who Jesus Christ is. We don't do topical sermons on self-help. We do that for a reason. Because our philosophy, my words of wisdom, my wisdom in being a husband or a father falls short. Our goal as a teaching team at Salt Church is to take you and point you to Christ, to get you to understand the riches and the depth of Jesus Christ. And if you have that, if you're transformed by the power of Christ, those things will then transform your life. It's Christ that you run to for help, not humanity. So to have a firm foundation of faith, you have to know where you stand, You have to be at a church that can define where they stand on specific theological issues. And we have to move forward in both knowledge and accountability together in those things. Or else we might as well create a big ship and get in it and let all the cultural things that will happen over the next 10, 20, 30 years, basically fake Christianity just toss us around. Now practically, how does this work itself out? Verse 15. Paul says, but speaking the truth in love, let us, that's the church, us, grow in every way into him who is the head, Christ. From him, the whole body, fitted and knit together by every supporting ligament, promotes the growth of the body for building itself up in love by the proper working of each individual part. If we're a community of believers and we're united as a family under the umbrella of Christ, if we're striving together toward unity and maturity, we must do this church with patience and love toward each other. Uh, The gospel of Jesus Christ should never be wielded as a club of righteousness that when another person in our congregation doesn't get it, we just beat them with the club and cast them away. No, Scripture tells us as Christians, we are to speak truth to one another, but we are to speak lovingly to one another. 
At the beginning of this chapter, again, Paul tells us that we're to be humble and patient and gentle. Those are qualities that are of a unified church. And when we act that way toward each other, when we treat each other in those ways, we see that that is what grows us into Christ. As Christ being the head, Christ is the one who supports, just like your head does on your body. He's the one who supports, guides, and leads the body. So the more we are like Christ as a church, the more humility, gentleness, and patience we have with each other, and the more this church looks like a real body. Uh, I hope after three weeks you're starting to kind of see how this all works. Uh, Look at verse 16. Paul talks about the whole body, how it's fitted and knit together how the body is supported by every single ligament. Uh, Your human body has 206 bones in it. Your body has 79 organs and 900 ligaments. All of those things work together for your body to function. If one of those things goes down, uh, your body won't function as it should. It's no different for the church. Christ has given us measures of grace. He's wired all of us in some way with the gifts that he's given us. Some of us in this room are a bone. Some of us are an organ. Some of us just play the role of a ligament. But together, we come together and unite under those things and make up the body of Christ. Uh, So 30-second application. Uh, My application this morning is I hope that you can see this morning Uh, that you as an individual have an important part to play in the collective function as the church. Uh, We're extremely blessed at this church. We have a lot of volunteers. I think two-thirds of our adult adult congregation serves in some capacity. That's an awesome statistic. Uh, Those of you who serve in some capacity at Salt Church, I want to tell you this this morning. Thank you. Uh, Without you, Uh, the body of Christ would be borderline non-existent. This church isn't structured for everybody to walk in here and listen to me preach. The church is not effective if it doesn't have people. So this is a call to action this morning. If you serve right now, some of you might have served here for three years and two months at this point, and you're tired. What are those things that you have to do to maximize your function within the body so we could get to where we need to be? If you don't serve right now, Maybe you just started coming here, you've come here a while, and you just fill a seat on Sunday. There's nothing wrong with that, but we would encourage you to get off the bench. Uh, Don't strive to be the appendix, which can just be pulled out and nobody cares, right? We want to be something different. We collectively, church, are a body, and we are individual members of the body, and we make up a local church. We must use our gifts to strive toward unity. We must speak to each other in love. And we must strive to pour a foundation in the area in which God has placed us, which is Waddell or whatever this area is. And we pour that foundation of spiritual maturity at our local church where people can come in and they can grow in Christ. And hopefully the prayer is, as we do that collectively as a body, we can then expand the kingdom of heaven where God has placed us on earth. But church, all of us do this together. Would you pray with me? Uh, Father, I thank you for your goodness in this place. Uh, God, I thank you for this church. Uh, Lord, you've equipped Salt Church with unbelievably generous people with their money, uh, their time, uh, their talents. Uh, Lord, I look at just the worship team over the past couple weeks. Lord, you've gifted us in so many different ways that it cannot skip a beat even though the leader's gone. Um, God, that's how you intended this to be. Uh, Lord, this place shouldn't be built on one person or three people or, or anything, God. It shouldn't be built on any part of the body, Lord. It should be built on the head, which is your son, Jesus Christ. So, God, we submit to that. Uh, we submit to that level of authority. Uh, Father, I pray for the people in this room uh, who honestly, they don't know you. And God, they come in here confused. Uh, they're tossed about by all kinds of different doctrines. Uh, Lord, I pray that Salt Church can be a church that can clearly represent who you are. Uh, God, that we can teach in such a way that things are clear, that people give their life to you, that they see in you is fullness of life that they cannot receive anywhere else. Uh, Father, I pray for the people in this room that are discouraged in their service right now. Uh, Lord, that you would bring their ministry leader or just somebody next to them to keep them encouraged. Uh, God, that you could keep us upright, knowing that some of us in this room uh, have a huge time commitment to this church and then others don't. Uh, But Lord, collectively, we all need each other. We need to grow together and we need to promote unity within each other. Uh, So God, over the next couple weeks, I just pray, Father, that you do what you need to do in this church. Uh, Lord, we really don't care. We want to do what you want. So let us have discernment in the way that you're leading us. Uh, Lord, let us have a clear ear to hear you in all things. 
Uh, Father, I pray that you convict hearts in this room that need to be convicted, uh, provide repentance where it's necessary. Uh, But God, you could just push us in a direction, Lord, that we can just get serious about what we're doing here. And Lord, ultimately, that we can just be a radiance of your glory as we meet here at Canyon View High School every Sunday. And so God, I give this place to you and ask that you lead us in whatever way you want to. It's in your son's name I pray, amen.